work at the Ford Foundation, and I have the pleasure of moderating the panel today. Um, I think often, you know, we've been hearing a lot about a tipping point in this market, and the go-to often is looking at institutional capital markets as um, the group of capital that we really need to move to get there. And um, my panels today represent a combination of institutional investors uh, as well as wholesalers, development finance agencies, many who have institutional capital to invest, others who are playing a real role as a catalyst to engage that marketplace. So um, I think before we move to where we could go um, in terms of the institutional capital markets, it's good to kind of start with the history, um, especially with um, these four panelists and their own institutions, how they've engaged in the market and where they are today. So I'm gonna ask, I'll have, um, Sir Harvey McGrath, start us off. He's um, serving in his role as chair of Big Society Capital um, to kind of give some background on Big Society Capital, how you got started, um, where you are today. Thank you and, and good morning. So Big, Big Society Capital is a wholesale social investor. So, so what is that? Well, first of all, it's a wholesaler, so it doesn't directly fund frontline organizations. It funds uh, a range of partner organizations who in turn fund those frontline uh, organizations. Secondly, uh, we are a social investor. And so by charter, what that means is that uh, our focus is very much on, in the UK, regulated social sector organizations, so that's charities and social enterprises and they would represent 85% of the funds that we have provided through our partner organizations. So, um, as you can therefore tell, uh, for Big Society Capital, impact is sort of baked in up front. Um, it, 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 it's not uh, an optional extra, and it's an integral part of our decision-making processes and of our portfolio construction. We've been around for about six years. Um, we are independent of the UK government, although we're formed under primary legislation. Uh, our capital comes uh, in part from dormant bank account assets that have been swept through into a reclaim fund uh, and then downstreamed to provide uh, the bulk of the capital that we have. Uh, the other part of the capital, interestingly, comes from the UK's four largest banks who were um, asked if they would contribute uh, to, uh, to the capitalization of, of this entity. So we're uh, relatively new, um, and our mandate was both to deploy the capital, which is about £600 million, um, and to build the marketplace for this kind of funding, repayable funding, um, in the UK social sector. Um, we uh, have not leveraged our capital by taking on, uh, as yet, by taking on debt. The way we leverage it is to require co-investors to come alongside us. Those co-investors are, in some cases, institutions. In many cases, they are foundations and philanthropies and in some cases they are private individuals. So between our capital uh, and our co-investors capital, to date we've put about 1.3 billion pounds into this social sector market that has been developing in the UK. Great, and uh, Anna, maybe we'll turn to you um, representing Global Wealth Management at Bank of America. You're representing a range of clients in this market. Maybe you could give some background on on your team and, and how you're engaging. Sure, so uh, Merrill Lynch and US Trust are the wealth management arms of Bank of America, and so I work for the Chief Investment Office, and my role is actually, I, I run the entire uh, manager selection, selection team, so active equities, fixed income, passive, uh, and also all private markets, but for the last uh, six years now, a uh, colleague and I have been leading the impact investing strategy for the wealth management division as well, um, as both a way to reflect what the sort of evolution that Bank of America has had as it, as, as it relates to its own corporate ESG principles, starting with the environmental commitment it made, but also obviously to reflect what our clients want. 
And you know, while I'm not a direct asset allocator as an institutional investor would be, uh, we are the large, we are the sixth largest LP in the world, um, and we do have institutional processes in order to make investments on behalf of a wide range of clients, including. Uh, endowments, foundations, family offices that act as institutional investors, but also the retail channel uh, in the United States. So we oversee about $2.7 trillion in assets and therefore have to have fiduciary oriented investment processes uh, and act like an institution on behalf of, of these clients. And Anna, maybe you could just clarify when, when we're talking about impact investing, what range of kind of investment strategies you're pursuing on behalf of these clients. Yeah, so I, I guess I appreciate the comments on sort of taxonomy being uh, more of a difficult thing to describe. Uh, because we have all sorts of investors, we decide to use the word impact investing as an umbrella term, uh, but that does incorporate both sustainable investing, thematic investing, and uh, impact first investing. And we chose the name impact investing because uh, we took a client survey as all large institutions do to figure things out. And uh, our clients didn't like the word responsible because it meant that everything was, else was irresponsible and they didn't like social because it was maybe too moral or ethical. So impact seemed like the, the term that everyone likes. So that's why we use it as the umbrella term. Great. And David, I'll turn to you, Executive Vice President at OPEC. Um, you guys have been at this for a long time, but maybe you could, you know, for those who aren't aware of OPIC, you could give them some background on the strategies you pursue. Well, thanks, and it's great to be in a crowd that knows that OPIC is not an oil cartel. <laughs> it's the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is a U.S. government's development finance institution. And we've got a $23 billion portfolio across 90 countries in political risk insurance, in private equity, and project finance across just about every sector, from power to housing to um, $5 million deals up to billion dollar deals. So we're really looking to catalyze the private sector in emerging markets to advance development goals as well as foreign policy goals. And working with a range of institutional investors, including Bank of America, all the way through to insurance companies, private equity firms, and just about anybody you can imagine who wants to be exposed to, to impact investing. I've been doing it for 47 years. It's really, I think of it as the successor to the Marshall Plan, one of the proudest programs in American history. And we continue to need that sort of capital in the 21st century, and that's what OPEC's providing. Great. And, and Yuli, um, who's the Deputy Director of Equity Investment at the European Investment Fund, Maybe you could comment on, on the role um, that you play there and, and how the European Investment Fund is kind of pursuing a strategy in the impact investing market. Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, um, my role at European Investment Fund is that I'm heading the uh, investment activity in technology innovation, which uh, includes impact investing, venture capital, technology transfer, anything that is linked to technology, but also social environmental innovation. It's uh, in, in, in one umbrella deliberately in our organization. Uh, European Investment Fund is a little bit of a, a, a bizarre uh, vehicle because we are operating as a, as a public-private partnership with um, policy objectives on one side, but with a remit to be a catalyst for private sector activity in the fields of activity that we're operating in. And, uh, uh, actually, um, in, in any of the investment fields that we have, be it in venture capital, be it in um, general SME financing, or be it in impact investing, our objective is to be a catalyst and a pioneer in the market that demonstrates to private sector investors that uh, the asset classes that we are building are investable by institutional asset allocations. Um, that's, uh, that's our approach that we are taking. Great. Um, I think my next set of questions is going to be, you know, given where all of you um, stand, what, what capacity do you have to do more? Um, I think in the case of Big Society Capital and OPIC, there have been some recent policy um, moves that um, are going to enable you to have more capital at your disposal or pursue different types of investment strategies um, for European Investment Fund and um, Merrill Lynch, maybe you could kind of talk about whether there um, are internal kind of leadership roles that could be taken 
Um, if it's more client demand, if we need to see more things happen um, generally in the market. But maybe I'll start with Harvey and David and then um, move on to Anna and Yuli. Great. It's an exciting time to be here because just Friday, the president signed into law legislation that's going to effectively double the size of OPIC's portfolio. So we'll be able to work and invest $60 billion to catalyze capital that should be multiples of that. We're talking on the order of a quarter trillion dollars I expect to mobilize with that $60 billion. And that's going to allow us to tackle the world's most important development challenges. So there's a number of other additional authorities that we have with that legislation, but we're already operating across 90 countries, including some of the most difficult countries in the world, and trying to catalyze capital from institutional investors, something we've done as well as anybody, and expect we'll have additional authorities to be able to even be better in the years ahead. Great, and Harvey? Well, as I noted earlier, um, when we invest, we seek co-investment. Um, that's a key part of uh, building this uh, building this marketplace um, in uh, in the UK, and we see an opportunity to extend that fairly significantly. By um, and we're actively working with a, a number of uh, fairly large um, asset managers who are looking to incorporate um, deep impact into some element of their portfolio. So uh, what may emerge here is a sort of a 90-10 structure, uh, where we're the 10, uh, at the sort of the, the harder, deeper impact end of that spectrum, and the 90 is uh, ESG, uh, po positive screening. Um, uh, much of this will probably end up in the form of defined contribution uh, plans, retirement plans, as uh, those of you who were in the last uh, plenary session We'll have heard Nick O'Donoghue talk about the distinction between defined benefit and defined contribution. Um, because as uh, you will know, and it's certainly true in the UK, there is an increasing demand from the owners of those assets in defined contribution plans for product that has these characteristics. So uh, we're interested to explore how we can leverage some of the competencies that we've built in uh, big society capital uh, to enable those institutions who are servicing that defined contribution market to build in these kinds of exposures. Great. Yuli, maybe I'll turn to you next. Um, at the European Investment Fund, wh what's the kind of trajectory in terms of where you see um, the institution going and maybe expanding its portfolio and impact investing? Well, I think... Um there's one, one common theme that we have uh, in, in all our activities at European Investment Fund, which is uh, um, pretty counterintuitive at first sight. Uh, our kind of mission statement is to make ourselves redundant. Um, and that is uh, something that we believe that any development-oriented or policy-driven organization should do, because if we're supposed to catalyze the private sector in the fields that we're operating in order to take over from us. We only can be successful if actually um, the private sector effectively takes over our, our activities. If we look at the impact investment space, um, I think um, this is a less scary um, uh, perspective for any organization nowadays, given the figures that we've heard from uh, um, uh, Ronnie Cohen this morning, uh, what actually is the task ahead of us. Um, so even if we are super successful in making ourselves redundant, we will still be busy for a couple of years. So we should not be too worried, too worried about that. However, um, I think there's one fundamental change that we are currently, uh, in, are currently in the process of impl implementing in our activities of EIF, which is uh, to turn around our perspective how we go about mobilizing capital. And especially when it comes to impact investing, I think we are facing the issue that we are too much busy with uh, um, bragging ourselves how much money we have actually been mobilizing, but we are not sufficiently busy with the question of uh, whether we are able to direct that money to the right destination uh, when it comes to solving problems. And I think that is a fundamental change that uh, any policy-driven investor nowadays needs to take to the heart um, by... Um, actually going away from uh, just the perspective of what is the multiplier of our capital that we have been putting in the market and how much money came alongside us, to look at um, how can we change our approach to the markets 
to make actually impact that is necessary fundable. Um, I think uh, for um, for too long we have been um, busy with, uh, with with the first perspective of mobilizing capital. Uh, we are now in the process where we actually need not to look so much out there for co-investors for the projects that we are backing, but we need to look for uh, organizations that actually operate in translating impact necessity into fundable products. And uh, uh, the approach that we have taken to the market in, in looking intermediaries, in looking for partners, in looking uh, for um, uh, um, change agents in the system, has very much been uh, directed towards recently. Great. And, and Anna, you, you represent an institution that doesn't have impact necessarily a, across everything it does, but you have, right, I mean, just as a large financial institution, right. but you have a number of, of divisions and practices across the firm and a real commitment to this. So, I mean, I think it's harder for these institutional investors to, you know, what's driving it internally? Is it leadership? Is it your clients? Like, where are you seeing the big moves and, and kind of the next couple of years in terms of your engagement? So, you know, early on, I think it was a group of us uh, in the wealth management division that were doing this in our personal lives and really interested in it and uh, trying to build a business case to do that. And we did have uh, a couple of senior leaders that were, uh, I think, really forward thinking and, and helped us launch a social impact bond and, and ushered that through the system. And I think but, but it's interesting that, you know, over the past five or six years, um, actually a couple of months ago, uh, my colleague and I were in a, a meeting with a very senior manager and, and he said to, we had our classic presentation with like, here's the business case for impact investing and then here's the strategy and this is what we need to do it. And he said, oh, you don't need to talk about the business case. Like that's, uh, everyone understands that and that's fully baked. We, we, let's, let's move on to the strategy and how you're going to execute it. And my colleague and I <laughs> just looked at each other. We were like, oh, okay, good. All right. So that's been a good five or six years of our work and that's, Okay, so the business case is there now. So, um, but but I do think that you know we have we, we do have senior leadership. We certainly got schooled by a lot of our clients, uh, some of who are in the audience in 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 the early days and trying to push us. And our clients have actually been really really good in saying we will go right to senior management to tell them what we think you need to do. And so it is sort of, a, in all of these environments, it's a push and pull, it's a bunch of people trying to make something work um, until it, it becomes mainstream, if you will. Um, and then, you know, and then the, the, the challenge is then making sure that you're executing it um, in an intentional way. And I think, you know, from our point of view, we, you know, we certainly we started out in the public equity space looking at sustainable and ESG because most of our clients, that's the majority of their allocation is in public, the public equity or debt markets. Uh, and I think we've been a little hesitant, I mean, other than doing a social impact bond, which was, I think, probably sort of slightly uh, on the, on the, uh, out there on the risk curve for us, um, but we were committed to that space. I think we need to make sure that we are, uh, and we are spending a lot of time now on sort of the private impact markets and making sure that we can uh, take a client, you know, no matter what client we have, whether it's a foundation or endowment, um, or I'll try net worth a client and, and provide them uh, solutions across the asset allocation and across the space um, now that we have the mandate to do so. And, and I think that we can, um, so th that's really what we're focused on. Great. Um, David was talking earlier about, David Bodwin, who's up up from Generation, talking about the fact that there's a counter movement. Um, and we talked about that a little bit this morning when we all met. And I was just curious how, if you're seeing that play out, um, and for, for those people on the panel who have some capital that can be, serve in a catalytic role to the market, how you're using it to kind of reduce some of these barriers um, that are evident in the market, how you're countering some of this counter, counter movement, especially, um, you, Anna, in your role, um, I open it up to the panel. Yeah, I would just say there is absolutely a counter argument, uh, which is still that this is, yeah, that, that there's, a, there's a dividing line between what is fiduciary and not fiduciary in this space. So it's interesting because it seems that 
barring some recent comments from policy officials or regulatory officials, there are, you know, people who think that, okay, well, the public markets or this ESG integration or sustainable investing is market, we can tell that it's market based return. And so as long as a fiduciary, as you are thinking about risk and return, it is okay to think about these other things too, basically is what, what a lot of the writing says. But there seems to be this really big dividing line, which is if you're considering impact, social and environmental impact first, then that's still against what it means to be a fiduciary. And that's a very, very, very huge hurdle to get through even if you are, you know, even if you are starting to deal with products which you do, you have that are there's catalytic capital or there's some guarantee or other de-risking or liquidity mechanism that's attached to these, it still is very difficult for um, those those um, institutions that fall under this very sort of we call it big F fiduciary. Uh, type of framework, but for individual clients and foundations and endowments and other entities that actually don't fall under the big F, they, they sort of only fall under the little F fiduciary, that's actually not as big of a constraint, right? But, but there, is, there, there certainly is this strange dividing line, which I, which I see that concerns me. Anyone else? I was going to say, when people know what they get when they come to the development finance institution. Our goal has never been primarily to make money. We're proud of the fact that over the last 40 years, we've every year returned money to the taxpayer, including more than a quarter billion dollars last year. But we're really trying to be that catalytic capital that lets institutional investors be in markets in a way they wouldn't have been otherwise, and be in companies and funds they wouldn't have been in otherwise. So it's a different kind of challenge that we have as a development finance institution, seeking firms that know they want to be in markets, but we can de-risk it through political risk insurance, through the U.S. government's ability to work with governments and on policy outcomes as well as on uh, projects on the ground. Yuli and Harvey, I don't, do you have anything to add? Yes, I think there's a, f for us, there's a, a quite a challenging issue here, um, which is that some of what we do, which is uh, trying to tackle some of the most difficult social issues um, actually does require some form of subsidy or a willingness to see a concessionary rate of return on the investment. Now, uh, there are clearly um, people who are prepared to do that. Um, many of the uh, foundations that we have worked with uh, where we are doing something that is in their domain area um, who would otherwise be making grant funding available um, are interested to come into structures where there is a return of the capital. So it's not a grant, but the return on the capital may be below their, uh, their threshold. Um, uh, so uh, we see a, a, a need for um, some ongoing um, form of blended finance uh, to support uh, certain types of interventions where one mixes um, uh, grant funding uh, or perhaps government support uh, with, uh, with sort of commercially priced uh, debt uh, or equity that would have commercially priced return expectations. Because otherwise, the, uh, those interventions, at least in their early stages of development, will, uh, will not survive. And so uh, we frequently run this conversation um, and explore that tension uh, between what is desired as a market right return and the reality particularly of early stage enterprises that are uh, tackling some of these more difficult issues. Well, I think that the point that Anna was making um, of the definition of what is fiduciary duty for asset managers and how that translates into the allocation of, uh, of assets to portfolios is a very central one. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that the impact investing space is facing. Uh, simply because um, as long as we don't get that nut cracked, um, we are going to have massive amounts of money um, raised out there in the market, but for impact that actually could have been funded anyways. Um, if we're looking at the real inconvenient impact, the one that doesn't fit in the risk return profiles that we have got in portfolios, I think there is a, a need for a fundamental 
change of the approach that we are taking to, to mobilizing capital. Um, I think if, uh, if, if we look at um, uh, the, 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 the strategies that, that we are applying, um, when we make the distinction between impact first or financial return first, I think it is about time that we find a new definition of what impact first means. So far, we are going always by the assumption that impact first means that we are privileging impact over financial return. If we try to sell that to the large um, community of uh, uh, mainstream investors, this is not going to get us very far because I don't think that the time frame between 2018 and 2030 is enough for converting the mainstream asset management class into philanthropists. It's just not going to happen. So if we are looking at impact first investment that we are going to, um, that we are, that we, that we are going to, to need for, for getting to, to that tipping point, we actually need impact first being defined as defining, having stakeholders out there in the market that look at what impact needs to be done to actually secure our sustainability as a society. And then what means can we deploy to create funding instruments that tap into the pool of market with risk return profiles that are placeable in the market in order to mobilize that capital. And I think naturally, DFIs would have that role because they are normally there to identify the big issues in the market. They are there to um, uh, create um, um, solutions, funding solutions for that. They are there to have the technical expertise to segregate the meaningful investments from the less meaningful investments. What we unfortunately do not have any longer with DFIs, which we had 15, 20, 25 years ago, is the risk-taking capacity of DFIs. Because if you look at DFIs in today's perspective, they have all migrated either because they have been forced by regulatory intervention or by their own submission to banking acts into a risk return profile for their asset allocation that is actually totally equivalent to the private sector commercial banks. Which means that today, when we talk about impact investing and talk about funding the inconvenient impact in the market, the one that is not fit for mainstream asset allocation portfolios, we've got DFIs that are competing more with the commercial banking sector than actually making impact fundable by taking risks that others would not take. So I wonder if you think that's true about OPIC. Um, because as I've talked to other DFIs, I've heard people say they're proud to be in top quartile funds. I've never heard anybody say that at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. I've never heard anybody, we're not subject to the same banking regulations that European funds are. And so I really feel like we are going into the world's most difficult places. I earlier this year visited Togo, where we tripled the amount of power in Togo. That's hard to do, um, and we catalyzed private sector capital to do it that wouldn't have happened otherwise. We work with first-time fund managers because we think the entrepreneurial ecosystem is important to build out, as opposed to some of the name brands we've heard about getting in the field now. So uh, maybe I know OPIC better than you might, but I, I wonder if you've heard that about OPIC because it would be something that I haven't. I think, I think OPIC is, is, is indeed... Um not so much as a, operating as a, as a kind of banking organization, but it really is a dev development organization. And I would, I would give you credit for that and, uh, and encourage you to spread the word. <laughs> All right, I see a question from the audience. I don't think there are mics, but if you say it loud enough, I will, I will repeat it. Uh, there is a network called the Network for Green in the Financial System, which is led by Frank Elderson, who is a board member of the Central Bank in the Netherlands. It already includes 15 banks from around the world, central banks. So this is just for anyone to know. It's very interesting to actually connect with them because they're trying to actually not only green but also impact. The point I want, the question I have is, the discussion I had with Frank Elderson is, can we create like a, um, a combination between a training and a certificate for bankers? Like, you know, in, in medicine, you, have a, you sign an oath when you become a doctor. So could we do something like that that becomes a recognized professional training for bankers, investors, so that they at least they are more aware of the issues and eventually they become a qualification? Well, if you don't have such a training, you cannot become a director of an investment organization. I don't think that necessarily the 
education and the awareness and the sensitivity and the sensibility of, uh, of staff in the financial system is the biggest issue. I do think that the biggest problem that we are facing in connecting the institutional investment space to a tangible impact is that there is no incentive for an asset manager to go in that direction yet. Because for the time being, we're still in a phase where we've got a client community that is looking for impact um, as being a component in the portfolio to, to show that there's impact sensitivity, but it can be pretty much any impact. We're still in the process where we are looking at investment opportunities out there in the market that create impact, and we do basically nothing else than apply a negative screening to that, where we select from those opportunities those that fit in a risk return allocation. And that is the problem that we have, that we are actually funding opportunistically impact. What we are not have integrated yet, uh, and that's possibly something which is going to be the next stage where we need to push the institutional investment space towards, is um, a, a differentiation in the market um, where it comes to not funding just any impact, some impact somewhere, but actually connecting impact to a specific cause. Five, ten years ago, anybody who moved into impact investing was fancy. It was an argument that worked with your client base because they considered you as being a more responsible organization when selecting asset strategies and things like that. We are now in the situation that the, that the word impact investing and the term impact investing in defining asset strategies for an asset manager has become so used that actually doesn't make a difference anymore. And I think we're at a point in time where uh, finally asset managers that want to differentiate themselves in the spectrum of competition out there in the market will have to find new ideas um, uh, to, to convince that they are better than the others and that they will actually have to come up with their own theory of change that they're pursuing through these ex uh, asset strategies. And I think that is a token of hope in converting the financial system that we need to build on and actually as a community build on. And the DFIs um, have, a, as I said, a big role to play in that because, uh, yes, we, we should have a risk-taking capacity that is different than, than, than of others. Um, we need to use that. We need to also to create in our own organizations a bigger awareness of what type of impact that we want to achieve because even as a DFI, it doesn't help if I take bigger risk without taking it deliberately towards a specific uh, impact goal that, you, that I'm achieving. But I think we also can have a bigger look in the, in the spectrum of uh, stakeholders in the market like foundations and, uh, and family offices and high net worth individuals that uh, historically have been segregating very much their philanthropic activities from impact investing activities. That we look at how can we go about impact investing asking ourselves the Robinson Crusoe question. Robinson Crusoe question meaning that uh, if our means were the only means that we have to solve the societal issues ahead, how would we employ them most efficiently to get the great, greatest impact? And I think that is something that will lead us very naturally to the, uh, to the um, approaches like uh, Sir Harvey has been mentioning of, uh, of getting into more creative blended finance in more sophisticated de-risking um, uh, instruments that, uh, that we can use to give uh, institutional investment a better access to, to these finance opportunities. I think, though, that while we're creating more innovative instruments and, and looking at new business models, you know, let's take some of the older business models, right, the, the current asset managers and their current investment processes and approaches and, and transition those, right? And I think that this, what was brought up this morning around the reporting on outcomes and then for those investments that where it's appropriate reporting on impact to me is the way that you right because new business models and new structures and new products will take a while to go through the market and become accepted and then and then have the impact that they're needed i think you need to sort of take you know in parallel transition 
current investments by creating a competitive landscape via outcomes and measurement reporting where an asset manager can say, I'm not just going to say I'm, I'm doing this or I'm just not going to say I'm a responsible, but, but you can actually differentiate between managers. And it is in a really sad state at this. I mean, I, I cover 1,500 uh, different investment strategies, not all ESG, um, but even those who are ESG or sustainable or impact do a really bad job. M not everyone, m m many of them, most of them, do a really bad job actually translating what they're actually trying to do from an outcomes perspective, let alone impact. Right? That has to completely change. And I think even you know, sort of run-of-the-mill traditional asset managers could differentiate themselves right by by sort of thinking about outcomes and measurement and, and impact reporting as, a, as one of these competitive advantages. So I would welcome other questions if people have them. Maybe you can just flag your hand and I'll, I'll definitely call on you. Um, but to stay on this theme I, of, of impact reporting, um, another theme I think of the conference has been on kind of the sphere of greenwashing. There are a number of traditional um, investors moving into the market. Some view that as positive, some are real skeptics about it. Um, Gita this morning was saying we have to put the impact back in impact investing. Do you, do you all feel this is an issue we need to concern ourselves with? Um, is it, should we just be kind of putting capital um, into the market and um, kind of ensure that we have systems in place internally with fidelity? Like how, do you, how do you think about this? Is this a real risk for the market? Well, when, when I was coming into this job, I talked to everybody that I could, from poets to philosophers to politicians to practitioners, about how capital can best unlock human potential. And some answers were regional, some answers were particular industries, some were different asset classes. And so what I wanted to do was to catalyze more money to the sector. So I welcome more investors, institutional investors, small investors, everyone in between. Uh, because as I was saying earlier, we've got to try different experiments. I think the market will sort it out. Right? Uh, my colleague Bill Pegues and I were just in Dharavi two days ago in Mumbai, where there are over a million people living in less than a square mile, and some of the most true entrepreneurs you'll ever see who are recycling plastic and tanning leather. But at the end we, of that tour, we, we saw some of the families there who were in pottery. And it reminded me of a, a story I heard a while ago about a teacher who divided her class into two different sections. To one class of pottery, half the class of pottery, she said, I want you to study design. I want you to study the history of pottery. I want you to study the best way to make a single pot at the end of the semester. To the other half of the class, she said, you're gonna be great in the quantity of pots that you make this semester. Make all the pots that you can, and at the end, you can put your best pot into a competition. And you know who won? The people who won are people who made the most pots because they got right to it, they experimented, they failed over and over again, and they came up with a way to do it. And so, for different investors to come in, Wonderful. I'd love to see everyone working with the tiniest micro credit in the world up to the trillions that are going to be needed for sustainable development goals. And I hope that as we move closer to 2030, this is sorting itself out. Any other reflections from the panel? I mean, I, I would very much agree with that. I think it's, it's to be welcomed. Um, uh, I think uh, the market will sort it out. Um, by the way, I think part of that sorting out uh, will be uh, us collectively addressing this issue of uh, reporting um, of, uh, of impact. As we heard this morning, there are 150 plus different, uh, different frameworks uh, out there uh, for, uh, for reporting um, impact. Uh, we clearly need to uh, rationalize that and uh, and there is, I think, some good news in that respect. I think there is some, uh, some confluence taking place, um, uh, but we need to push that a lot further. Uh, there is, for those of you who are uh, interested 
in the UK today, uh, a report has been published by the current task force uh, on impact investment, which has been running for the last three year and a half in the UK, on the landscape of reporting, uh, which is directly relevant to this issue. It's UK-centric, but it's taking a, taking a broader view of, the, of, of that landscape. Um, I'm really encouraged by the impact management uh, project. Um, I think that's part of the sort of the, the, the confluence that's taking place. And we at Big Society Capital have been actively involved in that project and are using the conventions that have emerged uh, from the IMP uh, to help uh, shape our decision-making process and our portfolio uh, evaluation process. So I welcome the, the wall of money that appears to be coming into the impact space, uh, but I think we have to push further the, uh, the reporting, categorization, and therefore classification of, uh, of what that money is doing. You know, since, I mean, I personally, I work with sanitation entrepreneurs, and often they say that it's the first investment that's the most difficult to raise. And then subsequent investments, you know, become easier, you know, as they go forward. And I think going back to the pottery example, therefore, I'm just thinking how can we increase, you know, the first investment flow to entrepreneurs so that they can actually make those parts and experiment and then you know find out the best part that actually fits uh, the situation so any comments on on that well, I, I don't have an answer for you but I do have an interesting stat so we did a um, our, we have 15,000 financial advisors at, at Merrill and US trust and um, we did a survey and, and anytime someone uses one you know, what we classify as ESG or impact investment, by the next one or two years, they have five. So it is a absolutely, you're, you're right, that it is the first one that's the hardest. I don't know if anyone has any comments on actually answering his question, but no, I, I, I believe that. I think it's, it's launch and learn. I've worked for the largest hedge fund in the world. I've worked for the most innovative venture capital firm in the world. And they've got feedback loops unlike any other. And the only way you learn that is by putting yourself out there into that first one. And one of the market theories I've developed over the years that I think that people in this room can help with when you're thinking about investments is that it's not completely rational investing. You can allocate your portfolio exactly the way that Bank of America says, but you need to be able to sleep at night with that risk return ratio. And so in my mind, the market works on an E, F, G, H theory, right? What drives the market is ego, fear, greed, and herd, right? And if we can reduce those factors in the right ways, people can go to sleep at night, people can wake up proud of the investments they're making, and that's what's gonna change the world. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Um, so, I'd love to, you know, get a sense from you you know, almost what's keeping you up at night, with, other than maybe jet lag these days. But um, in terms of headwinds, tailwinds you're seeing in the market right now, what's concerning you? Where are you seeing real opportunity? And Harvey, maybe I'll start with you. Well, it's a point that I touched on earlier, which is that um, I think there are a class of issues that require tackling that um, will not um, uh, be uh, short-term uh, capable of producing uh, market-level returns. Um, uh, there's a spectrum, isn't there? And uh, uh, there are many of us who are actively incubating um, and growing uh, social enterprises uh, and they need uh, longer-term patient support uh, to grow through their early phases. Um, and my challenge is that, uh, that I'm not sure that that part of this market, which I think is a critically important part of this market, is well understood um, and easily mainstreamed. Um, but it needs to be done because uh, we need to feed that pipeline of investable propositions uh, to enable that wall of money that we talked about uh, to be absorbed. And do you see, I mean, this gets to the, the comment earlier, but do you, do you see that um, policy unlocking that? Is it um, 
more philanthropy governments stepping up and solving for this? I mean, who do you see kind of playing that role as a, as a real catalyst? I think that there is, is certainly a role for philanthropy. Um, uh, I think that um, there, is a, there is a role in certain circumstances for government uh, to uh, provide capital which will rank at a more junior level um, in the structure, uh, which will be longer term, um, and probably a combination of those will be required. And Anna, from, from your viewpoint? Uh, I think what keeps me up is Potentially, you know, I think that uh, uh, we're, I was having this discussion with a few people last night, and you know, I, I think that while there's a lot of hope, and we have talked about some of the challenges and the hurdles, I think that we, uh, as a movement, need to actually move more into the mainstream, because a lot of the, the a lot of these convenings that we have are phenomenal, um, but I think that they that somehow we have to incorporate those who are not yet we're preaching to the choir where, yeah i mean I, I think that there's a you know there for every stock that you want to sell for a bad company there's a buyer out there there are many buyers it's a completely liquid market for those types of stocks still right and if that you know is a signal to you right as an investor um that maybe the the risk is mispriced uh you know if the message is not getting out there and you can talk about the public or private markets right in this context that 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 there still is a lot of work to do and while i think th that this movement has made amazing strides um and there is a lot of momentum and there is a lot of press right uh, you know, it, this this movement may not be exactly recession-proof, if you will, at this point, and I don't think it's going to go away. I think there's a structural, I, I agree that there's a, stru so I'm not saying that's a fad or a trend or anything, because I do think that this is a structural and economic activity, and as I said earlier, there is a business and an investment and economic case for this, but I do think that it's not yet reached the breadth of the investment community that needs to reach. And do you have any ideas on how we get there? Well, you know, I think everyone has their part to do. My, my own is just, you know, bashing asset managers over the head all day long to do so, I guess. Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I'm lucky enough to have a role that I can, I can reach a lot of them and, and, and uh, you know, hope, hopefully... My, my father was a, uh, a minister, and so hopefully my preaching doesn't get too annoying to most of the asset management industry, but I can t I'll continue to do it. That's great. Yuli, how about you? Well, I think what keeps me up, and, and maybe this may be a, a more of a European cultural issue than, than it is in, 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 in other parts of the world, but for me the biggest... Um, challenge that I think we are facing is to take down the barrier between um, um, concessionary capital and non-concessionary capital. Um, and um, Anna was referring to it for earlier saying that uh, impact risk is massively overpriced in the market and that is a problem of uh, getting actually products developed or even placed with them. But I also think that we have um, uh, these in in a, in a European cultural context, we still have got this uh, um, fear of um, uh, capital abusing of social issues to increase individual profitability. And I think this is something that we, if we want to get capital available at scale for the real burning issues that we need to fund, we need to get that barrier down. Um, and I frequently use for that purpose, the, the mindset of an entrepreneur when an entrepreneur goes about uh, funding a business model. Um, I don't think that any entrepreneur that is after a project would pay more for the raw material called capital more than it is needed. If I've got a project that goes for a purpose and I can get all the money I need for it for free, I don't think that any entrepreneur would pay any penny more than getting it for free. However, if you have a problem at hand that is so big that you need to access more capital than you get for free, you will have to pay for it. 
and maybe you get some of the capital for 3% and then you get some capital for 5% or some capital for at uh, inflation rate. But at a certain point in time, you will have to tap into capital that is really at big scale and you will have to tap into mainstream markets and yes, you will have to pay market returns. And I think this philosophy of seeing capital as a raw material in the process of achieving impact is something that we need to get into our mindset and I think we are not even halfway there. And David? Um, I have a unique opportunity to work at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which I think has the potential and the history of being one of the great impact investors in history. So what keeps me up at night is trying to make sure that 300 people that work there are unlocking human potential in a way that we can get to scale. And not just thinking at an organizational level, not just thinking at a national level, but you see these 22 flags behind us at a global level because it's easy to build 20th century infrastructure, but it's hard to build 21st century societies, and it's gonna take trillions of dollars, and I think OPIC can be right in the middle of that, and I don't know how to do that yet. Well, I, we're, we're coming up on time. I'd love to end with a, a positive outlook and, and some positive trends you're following or what, what you're kind of most uh, excited about in the next couple of years, either on a, on a personal or through, through your firm. Well, what I'm excited about is the fact that, that you know, we're all here because we have a huge conviction uh, that this is, uh, this is a momentum uh, which is growing and it's growing globally. Um, and uh, what I'm really excited about is the, is the part we can play in that, uh, to drive, drive that movement, momentum and that movement forward. I, I think I actually am excited to just given my role in terms of selecting investments that there are so many more investments to select from that I think are really good, really impactful and intentional at the same time than there was five years ago, certainly seven or 10 years ago. Um, so that, I, I think just having that set of investments that are good investments in addition to being good impact is, is, is really positive. So I was at the United Nations last week, it reminds me of this with the flags here. And it was found on some of Roosevelt's principles of the four freedoms. And I think we're going in the right direction when it's freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It might be hard to see in the day to day, but I think we're going to a better future. And I think impact, as people think about more than freedom from want, impact investors are gonna help us get there. I think if I had to name one a token of encouragement that I take is so when I look at the uh, discussion on the next uh, programming period for the European Union, which has actually uh, taken uh, the social pillar as one of the core pillars for its activities uh, for that period. I think um, having that recognized that uh, the social cohesion is uh, a prerequisite uh, for the European continent uh, to secure prosperity is a very uh, powerful token of uh, recognition of what is behind the force of impact investing. Great, well on that note, um, help me thanking the panelists and thank you for your questions. Thank you.